was betting on the stock market. I was highly leveraged and I got totally wiped out in 2008. Yeah, I mean, that's what investing is all about, right? Investing is all about, I think the lessons that I learned there and many times not the lessons what most people want to hear, but I think that's why they're even more true. One of those lessons is most people do it the other way around. They have very little money. They don't want to earn much money and then they rather want to have, I could change my opinion tomorrow and I would go all out of crypto and I would, in the theory, there should be no risk, but wow, this is amazing. Like who got Bitcoin under 30,000? Hi, I'm your podcast host, Marilyn Wilkinson, and we have a very special guest here today, Julian Hoss, CEO of Cake DeFi, blockchain and Bitcoin expert, and best-selling author of five business, blockchain, and crypto-related books. Hello, Julian. Marilyn, hey, looking forward to talking. Thank you so much for joining us today. So we've got a lot to talk about, but I'd like to start with you. So tell me, how does a medical doctor and professional kite surfer end up running a DeFi business? I was a professional kite surfer before, so for almost 10 years, I got to travel the world. I got to travel to yeah, almost 100 countries. It was a fantastic life that I had uh, between the age of uh, yeah, 17 all the way till end of 25. And um, it opened the door and the opened the horizon to a, a lot of ideas. And I, I then realized, okay, I wanted to do something serious in life. I became a medical doctor, studied medicine, became a trauma surgeon, worked uh, in, in, in the hospital. And I got really frustrated with how stuck and stubborn and stiff the, the medical system actually is. And um, then I was like, okay, you know what? I really would love to innovate a little bit more. Let me get into the entrepreneurial side of medicine. And so I quit working as a medical doctor and I tried to actually get a medical startup off the ground. And that, that was in 2012. I tried various things. It doesn't matter if it was robotics, um, anything that it came to gene technology, even um, booking systems for doctors, whatever kind of I could try, I tried in the medical field. And then none of those really at the end uh, hit home. Uh, in 2014, I then learned about blockchain and I thought, wow, this could be so interesting to get uh, the data side of things connected for, for patients. And blockchain would be fantastic for that. I tried, I learned everything that was about blockchain and crypto. And I, at the end, I couldn't get it off the ground. But in 2015, the finance side of blockchain caught me. And uh, that's how I got into cryptocurrencies. And uh, at the end, that's how I got into the decentralized finance space. And uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's been the kind of, that's been the main domain over the past eight years. So I definitely want to dig deeper into um, the decentralized finance side of things, but just to stick with you and your background for now. So you've had quite an exciting journey as, a, as an entrepreneur. So going from you know medical tech to fintech and in your book, 25 Stories to My Younger Self, you talk about how you became a millionaire out of debt in, in just a few years. So just briefly for our listeners, how did you manage that? How I managed to get into debt to how I, managed, how I got out of it or both. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think like many young, I mean, I wasn't a teenager anymore. I was, I, I just turned actually, I was 22 actually. Um, I had, I'd learned how to make money quite well. I mean, I was paid quite well as a kite surfer. I, I did a lot of sponsorship deals um, and I was paid quite well, but I had no idea about investing, no idea about how, what to do with your purchase power. And uh, I fell for two scam artists, actually, um, in relatively short time. And many times uh, this happens uh, when you get greedy or when you get emotional. And for me, both of those things happened. And uh, it was 2008. I, had, I was betting on, on real estate and I was betting on the stock market. I was highly leveraged. And uh, yeah, I got totally wiped out in 2008. It was really devastating for me, just as you could imagine, um, because I was 22. I felt I was really successful at that point. But I was actually in debt at the, then with that. And so that was when I really kind of took up that journey to say, okay, what does it actually require me to do? I, my, my actual goal was to get a quarter million dollars, so $250,000, because I had assumed if I could just get 10% on that per year, this would be $25,000. And that's what a kite surfer would need for, for living a, a year. And um, I mean, it wouldn't be a, a lavish life, but it would be absolutely enough. And so I learned everything that was about investing in ETFs, uh, buying your own real estate. And uh, yeah, step by step, I worked my way out of that first. And then obviously, it was a fantastic timing. Stocks in 2010, 2011 did really well. 
and uh, real estate did really well. And so I worked my way out. And in uh, 2014, I, um, at the end of 2014, beginning of 2015, uh, when I was just uh, turning 29, I, uh, I hit that uh, magic $1 million uh, mark. To me, it was uh, not, it, to be honest, it was not the ultimate goal. It was a result of hard work, of, uh, of smart investment decisions. And um, sure, I mean, uh, it was a fantastic goal, but it was more of a result of, of actually what I wanted to do rather than uh, this is what I wanted to hit. That sounds like a really exciting transformation. So can you maybe tell us more about the lessons you learned from that? You, you mentioned investing in stocks, ETFs, like in terms of, you know, mindset or financial savviness. How did that help you then later with uh, crypto and DeFi? I think the lessons that I learned there, and many times not the lessons what most people want to hear, but I think that's why they're even more true. One of those lessons is if you cannot really control the destiny of where you put your money, you should not be expecting extraordinary returns. And so ordinary returns in the general markets are depending on what the kind of sentiment is, but I think they are between 5 and 10% a year. So this is kind of what ordinary returns are on an annual basis. And I don't think you should be expecting more than that per year if, if you cannot shape or control that investment. And so what this meant for me was, if I invest in real estate or I invest in stocks, I shouldn't be expecting more than that. And I shouldn't be gambling on more returns than that. And I think most people do it the other way around. They have very little money. Um, they, they don't want to earn much money. And then they rather want to have these high risk bets that hopefully yield massive returns for them. And for me, it was the exact other way around. I was all about increasing my income. I, my, my goal had always been to, to get to a six-figure income a year because I felt if I was making $100,000 or more after taxes, this would lay a very easy foundation for me to, to get a lot of wealth. Um, because let's say if you can actually earn $100,000 after taxes and you spend half of that $50,000, well, in 20 years, even with zero returns, you would be a millionaire. And of course, maybe for a lot of people today, 20 years sounds crazy long, but yeah, I, I, I still think, I mean, it's the, it's, it's the kind of um, the time horizon that, that you should be having. And so I think the first lesson to me was just always, instead of gambling on these high risk bets where you go all in, you should uh, read a bet on yourself and, uh, and really kind of expect high returns from yourself. And that, that was what I really learned at that time. And it's still what I'm doing today. But with Bitcoin, to me, the, the Bitcoin bet there was, that sure, Bitcoin is a very interesting bet, but if you go with too much capital, too much exposure into that bet, you become emotional. And that's the second big lesson, in my opinion. Um, investing has to be very rational. It should be, it, there should be almost no emotions attached to it. I always have this statement where um, a good investor is a mercenary that bets on the missionaries of their investments. So that means as a mercenary, all they care about is the money, right? They have no emotional attachment to the mission. They just get paid. And that's what you as an investor want to do. You don't want to fall in love with the investment. That's such a big danger. And so, and, and, and I, I mean, whatever I invest in, there's not a single emotional connection to that. Yes, I'm heavily invested in crypto, but I could change my opinion tomorrow and I would go all out of crypto and I would, I don't know, invest into something else. There's zero emotional attachment to that. And I think for most people, and that brings me to that third lesson, many, many people they have this black and white thinking. They have this, I need to go all in, all out. Something is bad. Something is good. They struggle with the shades. They, they, they struggle with that it's probably neither good or bad. It's probably both. It's somewhere in the middle. And this kind of thinking in shades is really, really difficult for most people because it actually means you have to think um, where the extremists, the, the kind of extreme left or the extreme right or the extreme white, the extreme black is so easy because you just go for one extreme. You don't have to think anymore. And most of the time, it's actually not the, the right decision. And yeah, for I, I, don't, I don't know a single investment today where I would say, oh, this is an absolute no-go. And I don't know a single investment where I'm like, oh, this is like a no-brainer. You should go all in into this. And, and these were kind of the things that I learned during that time. And um, so far, it has served me really well. Yeah, uh, some great words of advice there for people who uh, invest in, in crypto and, and DeFi. It's definitely super important to remain objective. And uh, even if it's really hard sometimes, especially when the market is as volatile as it is right now, the more you can just 
stay objective and keep your emotions out of it, uh, the more likely it is that you're going to be able to make smart investment decisions. Let's talk about Cake DeFi now and, and how it works. So first things first, how did you come up with the name? <laughs> uh, actually, the name was more of an idea from my co-founder, Yuzin. We had a couple of ideas at that point. We wanted to have something that was fun, that put a smile on people's faces, that, that didn't take the financial system all too serious. I think finance can be so dry and boring. So we wanted to have something that was a little bit fun. There were a couple of ideas left at the table. And then we said, okay, let's look at trademarks. Let's look at registrations. At the end, we went for cake for the reason, because in Singapore, cake private limited, which is basically, I mean, private limited, you always need that because it's kind of the company ending. But so cake was able to be registered. And so at the end, we registered cake in Singapore as the company. And uh, that was the final kind of decision. Awesome. So can you tell us a little bit about Cake DeFi and, and how it works? You know, if let's say I have some crypto, how can Cake DeFi help me to kind of generate more passive income from my crypto investments? The majority of users or the, the kind of target audience for us as a platform is really those that are already in crypto, but aren't all too deep into the various cryptocurrencies or they haven't uh, touched with, they, they haven't kind of looked into 60,000 of the opportunities. So the, the typical user that we attract, they own Bitcoin, maybe they own Ethereum, maybe they own a few other altcoins. The typical user does not already own hundreds of coins and the, the typical user also is not a no coiner. So they are generally in crypto. And then um, the main value proposition we have for them is that they can come with their crypto and we show them how to get yield on their crypto. So dividends or interest or whatever you want to call it. There's various ways to do it. For example, staking, this works for a couple of coins um, where you can get some really nice returns on your, for your staking. You can do lending. Lending generally works for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and dollars, dollars in, in, uh, as, as stable coins. You can do things like um, uh, liquidity mining where you provide pairs and then you can get yield on those pairs. You can do something like tokenization, where you help create decentralized tokens, a D-Tesla or a D-Gold and so on, and you're being paid for that. You can also lock up your crypto, and in return, you can get a loan against that, which then allows you to get exposure into other uh, forms as well. So at the end, Cake is all about having this one-stop platform to give you cash flow on your crypto, various ways, low volatility ways that have a bit of a lower yield higher volatility ways, and there you have way higher yield. So can you maybe tell us in more detail about, you know, lending, staking and liquidity mining, how they work, the advantages and disadvantages. So for someone, you know, like you just described, let's say someone has some Bitcoin and Ethereum and they're new-ish to the crypto space and they're just getting started with this stuff. Yep. Uh, what's the best route for them? There's two low volatility kind of services to get the yield, and that's staking and lending. Um, lending only works for the really large assets, and in crypto, this is Bitcoin, Ethereum, and dollars, and, and, and dollars as stable coins. Because if you actually look at the market cap, everything else is quite tiny in comparison to those three asset classes. The way here it works is you lend your Bitcoin, ETH, or dollars to other large institutions. And they then provide this to their customers so that customers can either short something so they can bet on something going down or they can actually leverage something, which means they really, really bullish on something going up. Whoever borrows those funds needs to post collateral. So um, in theory, and I'm going to say in theory, and I'm going to explain it in a second, in the theory, there should be no risk for the customer. But realistically speaking, at the end, there is always some risk based on liquidation levels, based on extreme volatility swings. Um, because even if the, the other party posts collateral, your asset can swing so far in the other direction that uh, you're basically under collateralized. So there's always some risk, but uh, with the collateralization, you try to minimize, uh, minimize this risk. So far in uh, three years, we haven't had a single time where, and, and we've had, I mean, we've had the COVID crash in 2020, where basically crypto did 50% in minus 50% in a single day. We've had those massive pumps where Bitcoin did 25% in a, in a day up. None of those days ever had any major impact. And I don't foresee it having any major impact. But um, as, a, as a lender, you always have to be aware of that. Um, the returns on that, also because the risk is relatively low, the returns are also relatively low. So you make between three and seven, eight percent per year on your crypto. 
But this can be super interesting. I mean, uh, this is uh, some really nice yield and you get the yield in the co- in form of a coin that you uh, lend out. So you would get it on Bitcoin or on ETH or on dollars. Staking only works for the coins that actually use staking as a consensus mechanism. Bitcoin, for example, uses mining. Um, Ethereum still uses mining, but is switching over to staking. And so instead of burning electricity and solving mathematical puzzles, that's what you do in Bitcoin, you prove that you actually have a voting power by locking up funds. And so you lock up coins. And when you lock up these coins, you get a voting right. The computer stored this all for yourself, so you don't have to do anything. So what you would be basically doing is just locking up those funds. And then you would also be getting uh, coins in return, just like in Bitcoin for mining, you get Bitcoins. Um, in, in the staking protocols, you get the coins for that. And so you see this as yield. Um, the, the yield on staking is way higher than in lending. And the reason for that is that a lot of that yield is subsidized as inflation. So um, it's the protocol that's subsidizing it. And uh, you, you, some is uh, transaction fees and some is a base fee. Normally, this is probably in the single digit percentages. But then on top of it, you always have some inflation. And so that's always why you have a higher uh, yield in staking. Staking is probably the number one use case that people do on on Cake because it is extremely low risk. It's extremely low volatility. The returns are really, really high. And so, um, yeah, that that risk reward model on staking seems to be extremely interesting. On uh, liquidity mining, which is the third really large uh, model, um, this is what we categorize as high volatility. And the reason we categorize it as high volatility is because you have to supply a pair. So you have to supply two coins. And what's happening in between this pair is what's called an impermanent loss. An impermanent loss means if those coins move against each other price-wise. So if, for example, uh, you you do a dollar and a cryptocurrency, if the cryptocurrency moves a lot against the dollar, you get something called an impermanent loss. And that loss has to be offset from the reward. So you want to have a high yield that offsets this impermanent loss. And uh, this is quite difficult sometimes to calculate. um, And that is why you... Um, why, why people want to have a high return on liquidity mining. But in return, and so, for example, you can also supply Bitcoin in liquidity mining. Um, you can get actually 50% on your Bitcoins. And so for a lot of people, they say, you know what? In lending, I get 5% for my Bitcoins in lending. But in liquidity mining, I can get 50% per year. Uh, sure, I have the impermanent loss risk, but this is kind of okay in comparison to my high returns. And so if you're totally new to this, to to DeFi and, and getting yield, I would probably stick to staking and, and lending. And then later on, I would dabble into liquidity mining, tokenization, um, and, and kind of start with those because obviously you need to understand the space a bit better, but there you have, uh, you need to get a bit of a sense for it. And then, uh, but the, the, the yield there is just so much higher in comparison to the other uh, services. So um, earlier you gave the example of someone earning 100k a year, saving 50k and becoming a millionaire in 20 years. So can I become a millionaire faster with the lending and staking? I mean, in theory, yes. Um, practically, the the major question obviously is always what do those coins do against the dollar? So uh, I mean, if even if you're getting, let's say, 8% on Bitcoin per year, Bitcoin this year is down, I don't know, I think 40% year to date. So um, that that's not going to help you, but you have 8% more Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin turns around and goes up in price again, you can, you obviously have an easier chance in, in becoming a millionaire. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, it's a, it's a definite yes, but at the end, um, the question, there's no guarantee that you're going to become a millionaire because it always depends on what the actual coin is doing. Um, yeah. I guess generally in investments, uh, there are never any guarantees, unfortunately. Otherwise, we would all be rich, right? Yes. Um, So I I heard you talking the other day, I think, about decentralized stocks. Can you maybe for our listeners talk about them and how they work? We categorize the entire group as a decentralized asset or a decentralized uh, kind of token or detoken. And obviously, those decentralized stock tokens fall under that. The idea behind it is if you think about putting a uh, a, a token of a stock or a token of anything onto the blockchain, you always need actually three things. Um, you need someone who actually issues the token. If we were to do this centralized, then we would have a bank or or uh, uh, an exchange or someone to issue that token. And so it's that person or that company, that institution issues it. And the second thing, you need some kind of backing. Um, and traditionally, you would buy a Tesla share and then you can create a 
a Tesla share on the, uh, as, as a token. And the third one is you need to have some kind of pricing mechanism because otherwise the to you don't know what the token is actually worth. And if you have the centralized way, then you would have an arbitrage possibility. So if the token would be under what it's actually trading, you could buy the token and redeem it. If it was too high, you could get the actual share or whatever and then sell it in form of a token. So you would always have this arbitrage mechanism. Um, the upside of that is that you would have very easy interoperability on a blockchain. You could do this really, really seamless. Trading fees would be pretty much zero. Um, the transferring would be quite exciting. Um, the, the, the big downside here is that it's completely centralized. And that centralization really is an issue because this actually doesn't solve much. It, there's always this, this major hurdle of, uh, of, of it being centralized. And so these D tokens or decentralized assets, you can completely decentralize that by the token being issued by the blockchain, the backing being done by cryptocurrencies, and by the pricing to be done by so-called oracles, which are linkages to the actual stoke, uh, token, the actual stock. And so if you kind of combine those three things in a decentralized manner, you get something called D-Tesla or D-Gold or D-S&P 500. It's not an S&P 500 or it's not a Tesla, but it has some forms of it, some, some kind of characteristics of it. And um, that's what's really, really interesting for a lot of people. And if you participate in that, you can also get some really high returns. That sounds like a very exciting possibility for people who are interested in investing and, and broadening their portfolio. Let's talk a bit now about the current market conditions. So there's talk of a recession. The price of Bitcoin has gone down from around, let's say, 42 to around 29. Can you talk about how Cake DeFi is uh, prepared to weather the storm? Yeah, um, our business model is... Uh completely different than those of exchanges. As an exchange, you make money when people take action. For us, it's at the end all about how many funds do people have in the services. And so our revenue does not go up as fast or it's not as spiky as that of an exchange, but in return, it's also way more resilient when prices go down. Um, if you look at Coinbase, Coinbase had an insane profit in Q4 last year but it had, I think, a half billion dollar loss in Q1 of this year. And for us, this would be almost impossible. Um, for us, it would be impossible to have such a spike in Q4 and then such a loss in Q1. Um, our revenue is uh, quite linear. Um, it's, it's, it depends, obviously, on how many funds people have with us. Um, generally, we have more and more users. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot of funds on the platform. So our revenue has constantly grown, measured in coins, uh, measured in dollars, obviously, um, if you compare our revenue for Q1 with uh, that of Q4, our revenue dropped by around 33% because that's what the prices actually did. Um, but then we are still insanely cash flow positive despite the prices going up and down. Also, because we have been cash flow positive now for two years, um, we actually have no outside investors. So the company is pretty much owned by myself and by my co-founder, Yuzin. We have actually put aside a lot of the money into, and we always sold the crypto into dollars. We have a lot of dollars in our treasury, in our reserve. Even if crypto were, were to drop by another 80% or something, we could easily have three or four years without any significant revenue. And we've just always had a very cautious approach to that. Um, yeah. So um, I know you're very transparent about the, the company's financial performance. As you say, it is a, a very profitable company. Uh, you even post the company's financial results on Twitter sometimes. But um, what were the early days of Cake DeFi like? Do you have any words of advice for our listeners who are maybe thinking about starting their own DeFi project? I mean, sure. I, I would start as lean as possible, um, simply by going for something where you feel this service makes it very easy to ramp up. It's an, a service that's very easy to kind of build and sell and doesn't need all too much of an operational kind of infrastructure. For us, this was staking just because it was so easy to set up. Um, the compliance around staking is very simple. Everything can be done on the blockchain. Back then we did a lot of manual work, so nothing was really automated, but it was very easy to get in and it was very easy to get started. And at the end, this allowed us within, yeah, I mean, we, we had uh, external investors. We bought those external investors out about a year ago. And uh, at the beginning we started, uh, using and I each invested $200,000 of our own money. 
Um, the external investors each invested a million dollars, so we had 2.4 million in, in, in capital. After a year from starting, we were cash flow positive um, because we were so focused on this one service. Um, it was yeah, so straightforward to, to build uh, compliance-wise. And this is always the same. I think it, it applies to any kind of um, business that you start. Um, so many companies, I think, they try to do everything at the beginning. Um, we niched it down. We tried to focus on this one thing. And that's, yeah, I, I think what uh, made it so successful. So um, that's that's really amazing that the company took off so quickly and was uh, was so successful. Can we maybe talk a bit about DeFi chain because Cake DeFi has its has its own chain, right? And it integrates with other chains as well. So can you maybe talk about how you developed that and uh, the relationship today between DeFi chain and Cake DeFi? Sure. Uh, I, I think today um, the company Cake DeFi and DeFi chain are really two completely separate things. It started off where, um, at, at the very beginning, using, and I didn't really know how successful was Cake DeFi going to be, how successful is the staking going to be, how successful is crypto going to be. I mean, this was in 2018, 2019. The market was still very uncertain, very insecure. And so um, when we started the company in June 2019, we then uh, looked into the entire DeFi space and said, hey, you know what, DeFi for Bitcoin, that's that's really been missing. Wouldn't it be cool to kind of fork Bitcoin and uh, and and uh, yeah and 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 create additional upcodes on the blockchain so that you could do lending and liquidity mining and have a decentralized exchange and have staking and so on and so on tokenization have many many features that Bitcoin doesn't have and so we forked um, the the Bitcoin blockchain we airdropped there was no ICO or something we we used kind of the Satoshi idea where we just gave away all the coins for free. And uh, originally, user and I got some coins. We burned those afterwards as well so that we ha would have this complete fair kind of start. And then, yeah, since then, the, the blockchain had its first block mined actually on Bitcoin Halving Day. I think this was the 11th of May 2020. I'm not sure anymore. Or maybe the 7th of May. I, I can't remember exactly anymore. But uh, somewhere uh, beginning of May, it had its first block mined. And uh, since then, the blockchain now kind of took its own, yeah, got its own character. I mean... Obviously, I'm still like I see myself as a chief cheerleader. I I'm, I'm still a big investor. I've I've actually bought a lot of DFI, which is the coin. Cake supports the 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 coin. It supports the blockchain, but Cake doesn't have a fundamental role in it. I don't have a fundamental role in it. Yuzen doesn't have a fundamental role in it. Uh, it's it's really a, a super strong large community today. Yeah, uh, maybe. Two and a half years ago, this was a bit different where, I mean, everything kind of got started by us, but uh, now two and a half years later, it's, it, it, it really kind of uh, dispersed into many, many projects. There's many opinions now when, when I post something on how the community should move forward. Sometimes I get massively criticized for that idea and people are like boycotting the idea, which is good. I mean, this is really how it should be. And then sometimes people are like, hey, Julian, what, what would you do there? And then I have an idea and then people say, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's go with that. Yeah, uh, I think on on Cake, the main thing what we're working on right now is like this concept of going multi-chain, which means uh, we we want to make this also clear on the on the platform that Cake and DeFi chain are really two separate things. I still think some people have this notion that this is uh, kind of the same thing, but uh, actually Cake and DeFi chain never had the relationship. It was always using and myself who had the relationship as 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 kind of the initiators for for DeFi chain. I think the main Interesting value proposition for DeFi chain is that it it is a fork of Bitcoin. It has the same principles. The core developers and and these core developers are not employed by Cake. Um, they are complete other kind of team. Cake still pays for some of the funding just because I mean we also benefit from it. So we obviously don't want this uh, to kind of get limited only by the community funds. There are a lot of community funding proposals that that pay for that as well. But we want to chip in. And uh, the big thing now, what they're building is like the second layer, which is like an Ethereum virtual machine on top that would allow DeFi chain to latch into so many of the other chains. And uh, that can be a very powerful kind of mechanism. So I'm quite excited to, to see that um, coming along. It sounds like you've got some exciting things in store. Do you have any other future plans for Cake DeFi? Maybe features or new chains or, I don't know, integrating NFTs, anything like that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, NFTs, we have been a bit hesitant on that because we feel it's so difficult to kind of, uh, yeah, not, uh, yeah, so that people don't kind of um, run into the wrong direction there. 
So we've been a bit cautious with that. I mean, the main thing on, on Cake is actually two things. It's going multi-chain, so adding more and more chains. And then the second thing is really making it easier for people to get the decision-making going on which coin to invest in, which service, service to choose. So have a bit of an algorithmic support with all that. So that's a, a very yeah important kind of feature right now where it's really um, someone should just come to us and say, hey, you know what? I have Bitcoin. I want to have low volatility. I'm okay with lower returns. What do I need to do? And uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't think we're there yet. So that's something we definitely, that's the direction we, we want to go. And so um, what do you think about the metaverse and NFTs in general? Like, do you own any NFTs, if I can ask? I I don't. Um, we have a fund um, with uh, at Cake Defi. It's called Cake Defi Ventures. It's it's our own money. Uh, it's like a venture arm, basically, um, with a hundred million dollars in in company assets. We've invested in NFT projects, but personally, I'm very cautious in in yeah betting on any of those, just because it's so difficult to judge what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. Um, I think long term NFTs, um, the Web three ecosystem, the metaverse, it's gonna be humongous, just like the internet is today. But I think it's so difficult today to kind of make your bets on okay, what are the things that are gonna work out for sure? And so that's just where we have been a bit, or I have also been a bit more cautious and careful. Um, yeah, yeah, I can I can totally understand that, especially as we're kind of waiting to see which. Uh blockchain will be the the dominant one because if you buy an nft on ethereum like will the ethereum blockchain be the one that prevails that's kind of the question for me i don't know how you yeah, see that 100 uh, percent. i mean I, I i don't i i wouldn't doubt that it doesn't prevail i think the bigger question is more which project prevails which which shape of form does it prevail at um and i think that's a bit of more of a question for me rather than saying will the metaverse be there in 10 years um, the metaverse is a construct, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an idea, and that thing will definitely be there, just like the internet. But it's so difficult to say which company in the internet is the one you want to invest in thirty years ago. Which, which of those companies did you want to invest in to to become super wealthy? Uh, which social media companies did you want to invest in? And then, obviously, if you invested in MySpace, you lost. If you invested in Big uh, in in Facebook, you won. And I think that at that point was just, I'm not sure if that was that predictable at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, at the time, I remember being super active on MySpace, and MySpace really seemed like the clear winner. And uh, it just goes to show that really <laughs> anything can change. Um, so speaking of how anything can change, how do you see the crypto market at the moment? We had a, an economist uh, on the show a couple of weeks ago, Ryan Shear, who spoke of a recession. There's also some quite depressing headlines out there at the moment. How do you think like, what do you think we will see over the next few, let's say, months? I mean, I'm especially over the next couple of months. I would definitely be on the more cautious side. Um, reason is just I I don't see the Fed at the end. The Fed has done has has been kind of the 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 guide that that, that shows on 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 what's really happening to the risk appetite and the direction that the market is taking. And so far, the the Fed has been very cautious, very bearish, and I wouldn't be. I wouldn't like jump in too fast right now. Long term, if you're looking at this over years, I think you're going to look at the prices today and you're going to be like, wow, this is amazing. Like who got Bitcoin under 30,000? Who bought, I don't know, DeFi chain at $2.50? Who bought Ethereum under 2,000? I mean, I think these are amazing prices, but um, I think it's dangerous if you speculate now for the next couple of weeks or next couple of months. I think you really need to have a bit of a longer term view here. I still think people are... Are, are way too optimistic about the next, let's say, 12 months, where I am a bit more cautious over the next 12 months. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see much upside over the next 12 months. And, and I think that's just important to understand, where I think many people, they're like, yeah, you know, the next three months, they can be a bit bearish, and then it's, it's going to go up. Sure, I mean, we may go up, we, uh, but uh, who knows if this has substance, or maybe we're going to go down again. And from everything that I, I see going on, I would just be a bit more cautious at the moment. Be diversified. I think that's a, a good part. So how do you see the longer term outlook then? If you're saying the next couple of months could still be a bit choppy, what about the next, say, two to five years? Um, I mean, there I'm way more optimistic about uh, Bitcoin gaining 
uh, strengths again, that people realize the utility. At, at the end, it's all about utility, right? I mean, that's what it comes down to. And people will realize that uh, Bitcoin, on the one hand, as, as digital gold, as some form of a payments network, um, obviously also as a, as a risk on tool, it, it does have utility and, and, there's, uh, and there's nice possibilities in there. Ethereum with the utility of uh, DeFi, of NFTs, of a lot of the Web3 space, people will realize, understand uh, how powerful the utility is. DeFi chain, the same thing. DeFi for Bitcoin, very powerful utility. And so, um, and then people will, will understand that. And, and at the end, that's going to drive demand and uh, more demand with, let's say, either decreasing or stable supply is, uh, it, uh, is, is very good for price. And, um, and so I would be very optimistic um, in, in that regard. I see. Well, with the falling prices of crypto in the current market, one could say it's a good time to go shopping, even though, as you say, we're not sure when the prices will go back up again. So do you have any advice for someone new to crypto? Dollar cost average in. Yeah, don't, uh, don't FOMO. Don't be too like emotional. Don't, uh, don't go in with too much of your capital. Step by step, that makes just way more sense. So for those uh, who don't know, even though probably most do know the term, dollar cost averaging is buying on a regular basis, let's say every Monday, 9 a.m. or, uh, you know, every first day of the month, as opposed to like trying to bet when when the value will be high or when it will be low, which in my opinion is much more fun. But yeah, DCAing is uh, <laughs> is definitely a good route to take. I mean, um, I, th I think the most successful investors are those that approach the topic of investing quite boring. There's not, uh, I think the, 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 the wealthiest investors, th th there's nothing exciting about it. And I think that's what people tend to forget. So yeah, that's just something I wanted to kind of highlight. Yep. Uh, that's definitely some good words of advice. Yeah. I guess at the end of the day, it's, it's not about having fun. It's about making money, which is what we want to do around yes. here. Yeah, I mean, that's what investing is all about, right? Investing is all about um, increasing your purchase power. Um, it's not about being part of an exciting community. It's not being part of, of having fun. I mean, just you, you need to understand why you're doing this, right? I mean, if you're someone who says, look, I don't care so much about actually increasing my purchase power. I just want to be on Reddit and I want to have fun with all these other people talking about uh, various investments. Fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But just understand that then you're not an investor. You're just part of a, of a community. Um, or you're like, oh, you know what? Um, there, well, I'm a, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. All that matters is Bitcoin, nothing else. Fine, that's that's okay. You, like being part of a community is important, but it has nothing to do with being an investor. Um, it's basically just you. I don't know, wanting to feel good, which is there's nothing wrong with that. But it has again. Um, I don't care about any of those things. For me, I mention this all the time. I'm a mercenary when it comes to being an investor. I just want to see opportunities. There's um, I invest in any asset class that I see and I think that it's interesting and I think crypto is very interesting, but there may be the day when crypto is not interesting anymore and I'm not in, I'm, I'm not married to, to any of the investments. So, and I think that's always important. So you're a pragmatist. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Julian. Uh, some great words of advice there and it's been wonderful talking to you. Marilyn, thank you so much.